So I, I, I guess I could start with a brief introduction uh, to our speaker before uh, leaving the virtual floor to him. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining in. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, who's Dr. Ryan Harley. Dr. Harley is an assistant professor uh, in, mechanical in mechanical engineering uh, at the, and a fellow of the Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he, prior to joining uh, Johns Hopkins, he received his PhD at the California Institute of Technology and uh, he was a, a researcher at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. His research has been awarded with multiple recognitions from the Department of Energy. And most notably, he's very fresh out of an NSF career. Uh, so we are very pleased to have him here. The, his research interests uh, span uh, 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 several aspects uh, on the deformation and failure of particulate materials, rocks, concrete, and ceramics using both advanced experimentation, experimental techniques and modeling techniques. Thank you so much for uh, uh, accepting our invitation, Ryan. Feel free to start whenever you are ready. All right, thank you for the invitation and uh, for everybody who's here to listen to me today. Uh, so I'm happy to present today some of my work on experimental micromechanics of 3D granular materials. So I'll be talking about a sort of framework for making measurements that help us examine micromechanics of granular media. And I'll talk about applications of that experimental framework to uh, Force, to studying force chains, wave propagation, local rearrangements, and length scales uh, in granular media. So I, I'm going to start with a really high-level introduction to granular materials, although many of you, if not all of you, probably uh, know about them. So granular materials, just where and what are they? They're pretty much everywhere in our natural and built environment. So you find granular materials as natural sands and soils. You find granular materials as rocks. They become these solid materials through geologic processes. You find granular materials as soils in many engineering applications, uh, shown here, civil engineering applications. And you also find them in many other applications such as packing and transport of food and agricultural products, uh, packing and manufacturing processes. So a lot of the solid materials that you're familiar with start out as powders and are sintered or otherwise made into solid materials. And granular materials also play a big role in defense applications of other materials like ceramics, which fail and undergo granular flow in localized regions and that granular flow dictates their macroscopic response or penetration resistance in the case of an armor ceramic. So granular media are everywhere and the in industry interest is really highlighted, I, I highlighted here because there's uh, tens, perhaps hundreds of companies who have formed consortiums to actually invest in really basic research on granular materials because there's still a lot of challenges despite their ubiquity in understanding some really basic processes that uh, granular materials support. So this is where granular materials are. What are some of the high level challenges with granular materials that are related to what I'll be talking about today? So the challenges I'm gonna highlight uh, on this slide include the development of force chains, which I'll define in a minute, uh, length scales and structure property relationships. So if we take a granular material and uh, it's composed of a bunch of discrete particles and we compress it, so you exert some sort of mechanical load on it, what these materials tend to do is generate these very heterogeneous and anisotropic chains of forces. So here, uh, or of highly stressed particles. So in the image on the left, the dark particles here are basically the ones supporting a lot of load or experiencing a lot of stress. And in this video of, the, of a pullout of a uh, 
a, a, a disk from a large granular bed, the light regions are indicating the particles, oops, sorry, indicating the particles that are experiencing high stresses and the darker regions are uh, experiencing very little stress. So this is a photoelasticity technique used to examine force and stress distributions in granular packings. And you, it very clearly illustrates visually this anisotropic and heterogeneous nature of uh, what we call force chains. So the, the force chains are what we uh, refer to as the highly stressed particles in these granular packings. So as that picture and movie illustrate, there are some length scales associated with these force chains. And so one of the challenges in granular mechanics has been understanding what length scales are set by, for instance, the presence of these force chains versus the length scales that are set by the packing of the material. So just the way particles arrange uh, themselves structurally versus other properties like energy dissipation, which might actually require much larger length scales to uh, get a sense of in a particular geometry. So these, these uh, questions of length scales and the, the question of determining these from experiments and using them to de define experimental parameters has been, uh, has been a challenge in granular mechanics. Taking this concept of force chains a little further uh, and thinking about it as a mechanician, there's also uh, a challenge in relating different aspects of this force chain to different parts of the mechanical response of the material. So one way that this has been done for a long time is by relating, for instance, forces greater than the mean to the mean force in your, your entire uh, granular packing to some sort of deviatoric stress or deviatoric stiffness and relating the forces less than the mean, so all of the sort of not highly stressed particles to some bulk resistance or some hydrostatic stress. Uh, so all of these sort of summarize the, the packing, anisotropy, heterogeneity, and the complex uh, length scales. We can also think about properties, mechanical properties, um, and physical properties that are related to these force chain phenomena. So we've been observing the signatures of force chains and uh, the way they influence properties for many decades in granular media. Some good early examples were the influence of the force chain structure on wave propagation, in where we saw the ability of changing the temperature of a granular packing locally uh, we saw that change in temperature having a dramatic change on the amplitude of waves that propagates through a system. The thought being uh, that the change in temperature changes the force chain structure and that force chain structure is ultimately responsible for where waves propagate through the system. Okay, so th this just highlights some of the challenges that have historically been around granular materials and continue to challenge us. So the things I've highlighted in red are sort of what we continue to investigate in uh, granular mechanics, which is how to study these forces in 3D, how to extract contributions to length scales and stresses in experiments, and how to start developing relationships between forces and, and physical properties. So what I'm gonna talk about in the remainder of the talk is uh, as follows. I wanna give a little bit more of a motivation to the micromechanics of granular media, particularly focusing on a little bit more specifically on some questions that drive the applications I'm going to show of this experimental technique that I mentioned at the beginning is forming this framework for our micromechanics investigations. I'll then talk about that experimental method itself. So how we uh, make measurements of both structure and stress and how we put those together in unique ways to probe all of these fundamental questions. I'll talk about the applications, uh, again, force chains, length scales, energy dissipation and rearrangements and ultrasound waves. And then I'll close very briefly with a little bit of a summary of some other things uh, that are on the horizon. Okay, so I'll start 
by going a little bit deeper into a motivation specifically targeted towards eventually addressing these applications. Okay, so the motivation here is uh, from micromechanics. And the, the fun, one of the fundamental questions in micromechanics is what do we pass across length scales to predict material behavior? So if I show a picture here of various length scales associated with the mechanics of a granular material, where I have a sort of field scale application where I'm maybe uh, designing uh, a soil structure for something or analyzing a landslide. I have a meso scale where I'm looking at kind of a representative volume of grains, maybe tens or uh, hundreds or thousands of grains. I have a micro scale where I'm looking at individual particles and their contact and their forces between them and their kinematics. And I have a, a nano scale where I have sort of roughness and, and tribological effects at contacts. So we have a number of properties and behaviors that exist at these different length scales. And we wanna understand <clears throat> how properties or behaviors at one length scale affect properties or responses at another length scale. So we might wish to understand how particle kinematics and forces can be used within a constitutive law or simply how our forces are arranged so that we can coarse grain for a stress at a macro scale. Uh, similarly, we might wanna understand how forces contribute to some of these physical or acoustic properties of our material. So historically, uh, and I'll, I'll convey this in, in the next slide, historically the bottleneck for a lot of this micromechanics in the sort of engineering materials, the 3D granular soils has been in quantitatively extracting things like forces and stresses from these materials. So we have had the ability to extract structure from things like computed tomography, but we've lacked the ability for a long time to extract forces in the same sorts of materials. And so that's gonna be a sort of focus or theme throughout the talk is the ability to extract stresses and forces. <clears throat> so, I'm eventually going to talk about these four applications and I'll give them a little bit more motivation here. So the first application I will talk about is force chains. So interparticle forces have already sort of uh, motivated the challenges with these. These are uh, these very heterogeneous and anisotropic uh, phenomena that demonstrate correlation lengths. So they depending on how you compress your material, whether it's in a biaxial stress state or a hydrostatic stress state, these force chains or stresses will demonstrate some correlation along some particular uh, orientation. And the, cor the, the correlation length and, and such will change as we change the direction that we're looking. Uh, so there's some, some interest in, in developing anisotropy from force chains. There's also this contribution to hydrostatic and deviatoric stresses. So we've sort of demonstrated this in the earlier slide as well. And there's distributions. So there are actually statistical distributions that tell us how likely we are to find very large forces versus very small forces, which has implications eventually for uh, a number of things like failure processes. The challenge, as I've highlighted, though, is that it's been difficult to access these forces in 3D powders that are stiff and representative of soils or sands. Uh, so historically, these have been studied using things like photoelasticity, which I showed pictures of on one of the intro slides, using soft rubber spheres or emulsions. In all of these approaches, one can access the force vectors at every individual interparticle contact, but it's been uh, challenging to measure them, as I said, in these stiff materials. So part of our uh, framework, experimental framework, will be addressing this challenge of extracting forces. So this application kind of exists in the meso and micro scale. We're going to be looking at uh, things that are generated at the micro scale and sort of how they come together at a MISO scale in terms of statistics. 
And there's some through some of our other applications, we're looking at how these look at a macro scale as well. So this is the motivation for force chains. Um, a related motivation, as we'll see, is particle rearrangements. So we have this uh, distribution of forces in our packing, in our granular assembly. And as we deform our material, we, we then get a redistribution of those forces and rearrangements of particles. So a really simple example of this is the generation of a shear band during triaxial deformation. We get these intense concentrations of local particle rearrangements in which particles are rotating past one another and sliding past one another. This region of the material dissipates a lot of energy and accommodates most of the macroscopic deformation. We therefore put these concepts of local rearrangements either explicitly or implicitly into constitutive models. So shear transformation zone theory is a classic example that explicitly incorporates this notion of a rearrangement and their statistics in, in a model that predicts the stress and strain evolution of an amorphous material. There's other models like non-local fluidity, which incorporate them in an, an indirect sense by talking about non-locality. So they dissipate energy, they facilitate deformation, they're included in models. And recently folks have been using some techniques like machine learning to try to understand what are the local structures that facilitate these rearrangements? And is the local structure enough or do we also need this, this idea of force chains to determine where a rearrangement is going to occur? So I want to address that question and experimentally predict rearrangements and quantify the energy dissipation, dissipation associated with uh, deformation like you see on this slide in our 3D examples, in our uh, experiments, which I'll show in this talk. This application sort of also falls at this meso and micro scale. Um, so again, we'll be looking at things like slip that occur at the, at the micro scale, and then how everything comes together at a meso scale to dissipate energy and facilitate macroscopic deformation. Finally, my last application will be really more towards the structure property relations. And so I'll look, I'll look briefly at ultrasound waves and how those depend on all the things we talked about previously, primarily the, the structure and the forces in the packing. The reason that we wanna examine things like this is that there are longstanding questions, for instance, in the way that uh, wave speeds scale with pressure, macroscopic pressure and the microscopic origins of that wave speed scaling. And there's also some interesting frequency and pressure dependent uh, dispersion and attenuation in granular packing that we may like to, to understand more from uh, the, the, through the lens of structure versus forces to determine how we might be able to predict and control these behaviors. So I'll look at this as a final example, uh, is how to, how to come up with these relationships between these responses and structure and stresses. This will be an application that sort of spans from the micro scale up to something like a macro scale, really an application scale that the experiments will remain uh, sort of meso scale. Okay, so this brings me to, hopefully I've motivated uh, some challenges in granular mechanics well enough. And this brings me to a description of the experimental framework that we're gonna be using to dig into these problems a little bit and generate some really novel insight into them. So these experiments are quasi-static uh, experiments on granular materials that combine two X-ray scattering techniques or imaging techniques. The first one is X-ray computed tomography, and the second one is three-dimensional X-ray diffraction. So this is a schematic of basically all the experiments that I'm gonna use in the coming slides to address our applications. And the schematic illustrates that we're taking a sample of granular material that's composed of crystalline grains. So it turns out if you go to a beach and take some sand, the grains are fairly nicely crystalline, but you can come up with synthetic materials as well. So you can take nice laboratory grown quartz or ruby or uh, anything you want uh, that is single crystal and do the same experiments with them. 
And we often do this because those crystals are nice. Um, and I'll explain why that, that's helpful in the coming slides. But we take a packing of granular material, we put it in a loading frame of some sort, and we compress that material and exert some sort of mechanical deformation on it. And then we, while we're doing that, we illuminate the material with x-rays and we incrementally pause the loading and rotate the sample 360 degrees and make two measurements. We make radiography measurements, which we use to perform x-ray computed tomography. And we look much further away at this detector at the scattered or diffracted x-rays. And we use this to do 3D x-ray diffraction. We do these experiments at synchrotron facilities because we need monochromatic x-rays. So a lot of the experiments I'll be showing uh, or the res results I'll be showing come from uh, the ESRF, the Advanced Photon Source or Cornell Synchrotron. I wanna emphasize that these experiments are on fairly small samples. So the sample sizes that we're talking about, these are the load frames that we're using. And I don't actually have a scale bar in here, but uh, this load frame, for instance, is about 10 inches tall. So it's fairly small and the sample environment is about two millimeters wide by four millimeters tall. So that's kind of the scale of samples we're gonna be studying and we have to make our particles small uh, in order to get sort of representative particle packings in there. Okay, a little bit more detail on how we do these experiments. So you have a sort of high level picture. There's basically two steps though. As we're performing loading, we pause and we make a CT measurement and then we make a diffraction measurement. And this is how those work. So for the CT measurement, we're rotating our entire load frame, our entire compressed sample. We, we take x-ray radiographs, which are basically density images. They, they tell us how many of the, the x-rays are making it through the material. And we perform these reconstructions with high resolution. We can do this for multi-phase materials and actually extract the individual phases. And we can use uh, image processing to segment out individual particles and track their deformation across multiple load steps. Um, so this is some of the, the software that we use, uh, MATLAB, Python, and SPAM to track particles and do this analysis. So that's the first step, and this gives us structure, which we'll talk about more. This is all the structure of the packing. The second step is the three-dimensional X-ray diffraction. So while that sample is still compressed, we now rotate it 360 degrees again. And now we're looking at the far field detector, that uh, big square detector further away. And these are all the spots we see. Those spots are uh, Bragg peaks or diffraction peaks that are diffracted from a single plane inside of a single one of these particles. And so you see, uh, you see thousands or tens of thousands of these peaks many of them coming from the same particle oriented at a different, with its crystal planes oriented at a different orientation. You can put all of these peaks on this plot of two theta, which is the inclination from the X-ray beam path and azimuth, which is this angle on that far field detector. And then you can sort of sift through these peaks and determine whether they're coming from the same particle based on their relative position. So this is a general data analysis process. You're basically looking for a bunch of these individual spots and trying to determine whether they come from a single grain. If you find enough of them that seem to come from a single grain, you assign that grain some lattice parameters that describe its crystal lattice. When you go to the next load step, you extract the same thing and you end up with another set of lattice parameters. And you can put these together and obtain a volume averaged strain tensor, an elastic strain tensor for every single particle. So the entire sample is uh, illuminated by x-rays and you can extract basically all of this with one rotation of the sample. And therefore you can get every average strain in the particle during this one rotation. And this average strain includes regions near the contact that are highly stressed and regions further away that are weakly stressed. It's an average over uh, the entire volume of the particle. Because we know the orientation of the particle, it has some anisotropy, but we know what the orientation is from the locations of these peaks, we can construct a stress tensor that's consistent with that strain tensor. 
Okay, we also know the particle material, whether it's quartz or ruby or whatever that single crystal is, we know the, the CIJKL. So we can obtain an average, a volume average stress tensor for every individual particle. Okay. So this is step two of the experiment. Um, this is what we end up with at the end of our 3D X-ray diffraction with some notes on the resolution. So the orientation even of a spherical particle is very accurate. The strain tensor is 10 to the minus fourth per component or actually better. Uh, and the centers of mass are to a couple microns. We can actually do a lot better with the CT. And so we end up putting the, this data together and using the best of what we get from each of these measurements. So in the applications I'll be showing for the rest of the talk, um, it's going to be emphasized that putting CT and diffraction together is what enables these interesting results. And so I, I like to emphasize that by using this, these techniques together, the sum is really greater than the parts. So from CT, we get very nice information on the structure of a packing, where the particles are, where the contacts are, and we can even generate a continuum equivalent strain tensor by tracking particles. From 3D X-ray diffraction, we can obtain a local stress tensor. But by putting all of this together, we can come up with interesting ways of determining force vectors, trying to extract constitutive laws without any assumptions, quantifying energy dissipation, and looking at structure force property relationships. So this is what I'll be emphasizing in the coming slides. And uh, I just emphasize down here where these experiments are possible, mostly at these first three, point, these first three locations, but we also are uh, looking at doing these in, in other locations as well. Um, these are all synchrotron facilities that have the necessary capabilities to make these measurements. All right. I'm now going to talk about the applications that I've motivated, uh, starting with the discussion of force chains. And our challenge, as you recall, was how to experimentally measure stresses, forces, and their associated length scales in 3D. Um, and I've, I've already gone through this, so I've sort of high, I've uh, dimmed out all of the detail. So let's look at a picture of uh, very idealized granular material in which we have particles and they're contacting other particles and we have a boundary. If we just look at the structure that we would get from X-ray computed tomography, we have a set of equations that we know governs that structure if the structure is in equilibrium. We have a balance of forces and balance of torques. If we put this together in a system of equations, we know from statics that the system when the system is very large, is only determinate for about four contacts per particle. And real packings in three dimension, even of spheres, tend to have much more than four contacts per particle, maybe four to eight contacts per particle. So by using 3D X-ray diffraction, we can introduce a second equation, which relates uh, forces analytically to the average stress in each particle. And this is what we were able to determine directly from 3D X-ray diffraction. It's that average stress measurement. And so now we have, we've doubled our system of equations and we can put these two systems together and try to determine all of the force vectors in this packing by trying to minimize any violation of equilibrium while trying to satisfy the stresses that we're seeing from 3D X-ray diffraction. And we can do this now uh, for up to eight contacts per particle. It actually works above that. Um, although the system becomes under constrained, it's actually certainly much better than just using the contact locations. Okay, so this is sort of the framework for determining inner particle forces. Now let's look at a couple, uh, well, first, does it work? Um, we've, we've used DEM simulations to show that we can actually extract this information about stresses, reconstruct the forces and compare it with what DEM gives us. And yes, we can say that this procedure does work um, and it works with pretty much perfect accuracy up to that limit of eight contacts per particle. As I'm just demonstrating here, all the actual forces are equal to the inferred forces. Now we'll look at some actual experimental 
results where we've applied this. So the first uh, time to our knowledge that this has been done was in 2016 uh, by us in a packing of quartz spheres that are in an aluminum tube. So I'm not showing the aluminum tube, but there's a, basically a odiometric test where we have a solid aluminum wall and two steel pistons compressing these quartz spheres. This is the load path. We load, unload, and reload the sample. And the sample is very small. So the spheres are 200 to 300 microns diameter and they're fairly perfect crystals. So we can do our CT and diffraction measurements. And this is an illustration of the forces that we get. So I'm not gonna put the quantities down, but you can just see I'm painting these, I'm scaling uh, forces linearly uh, at contact points based on their magnitude. And so you see the alignment of the things we saw in the first slide in 2D photoelasticity experiments we now see in 3D. We see these sort of linear force chain structures uh, uh, percolating through the material and connecting uh, the boundaries in the material. Okay, so we can now extract these forces. What else can we do with these forces? Well, we can start to study how homogeneous and heterogeneous they are, their statistics, uh, and, and we can start to study how they divide the material into regions furnishing the deviatoric and the hydrostatic stress. So as one example, we've looked at the probability distribution, just the statistical distribution of these force magnitudes. And in, in an attempt to understand whether these forces are more or less heterogeneous or homogeneous under load. And so one would expect that as you get a steeper and steeper uh, decay of forces above the mean, this is a probability distribution above the mean, you're less and less likely to find large forces. And therefore your material is more and more homogeneous in some sense. And so we found that as we compress this sample, the the forces get more and more homogeneous. So the material actually starts to look a little bit more like a homogeneous solid in some sense at the highest loads. And we have started to validate, to, to confirm this finding in samples with many more particles, up to 2000 particles, uh, where we've also studied other things, which I'll illustrate in the coming slides. Um, but we've, we're also, this is more of a, an important question in uh, the, the soft matter physics community of what these exponents are and how they evolve with loading. And we now have the tools to sort of directly probe them in these 3D stiff materials, which has until now been quite elusive. So this is a first demonstration that we can access force chains. And we'll start to use these inner particle forces in the coming applications. They'll, they'll be important for quantifying energy dissipation and the structure property relations and rearrangements. Okay, so we have this ability to extract structure and stresses and forces. Uh, one thing that we did uh, early on with this technique is try to examine a representative volume element, what I'm calling an RVE here. In, in uh, a representative volume element representative of the mechanical properties of the material. So here's another packing of spheres in an aluminum tube. The spheres are much smaller. They're on the order of 100 to 150 microns. They're, they're sapphire basically. And here's the loading path that we're subjecting this material to. So loading it, unloading it, we're basically cyclically loading this thing. And these are two of the load paths. What one can do is take the structure of this packing that we get from CT, this is the initial step right here, and we can put a grid on this, basically a mesh on this uh, packing where the nodes of the mesh are the centroids of the particles. And if we track the, the displacements of the nodes over these, all of these load steps, uh, the measurements are made at each of these symbols here, we can actually construct an, a continuum equivalent strain field within the packing. And so here you see some illustration of that strain field. And we know at, the, at roughly the same locations, although uh, mapped just to the particles, we also have the stresses. So one can think about looking locally at the stress and strain evolution in small coarse graining volumes. And so that's one of the first things we did to try to directly extract uh, a constitutive law and the associated length scale uh, 
by looking at the stress and strain distribution within some sort of coarse graining volume and look at how that changes and how they converge to the macroscopic stress strain here, just the constrained modulus or the P wave modulus as we make the coarse graining volume larger. And so we see some convergence actually that alludes to the presence of an approach to some RVE size or approach to some scale that's representative of the bulk. Um, but these samples are, are still rather small. And so we, we don't necessarily have a sample large enough to reliably extract the, um, the representative constrained modulus of the sample. So we're actually uh, continuing to work on this problem and we have some, um, some nice uh, extensions of this, which I'm just not quite ready to show here, but um, that, that demonstrate that we can extract some length scales that are larger than the samples themselves from these small samples. Um, the other thing we can do with these coarse graining volumes is actually relate the moduli to properties like the porosity or the maximum force within that cluster. Okay. So this is all I'll really talk about with regards to length scales. Um, I'd like to focus now a little bit more time on this question of rearrangements. These are really important when we think about granular materials. I've highlighted the reasons why. And what we want to do in uh, this example is to predict where rearrangements will occur and quantify the dissipated energy associated with them. So our guiding questions are twofold, and I'm actually going to go in reverse order. I'm first going to quantify energy dissipation throughout my granular packing using forces and these measures of kinematics. So another demonstration of putting CT and diffraction together. And then I'm going to start using some uh, basically machine learning techniques to try to predict where rearrangements will occur. So just statistical techniques really, and predict their magnitude and ask whether these forces are really important for determining where rearrangements will, are occurring or whether structural metrics immediately prior to the rearrangement are good enough. These are the samples that I'm going to be studying here. So uh, slightly larger samples than what we did our force uh, demonstration on our force inference demonstration. These samples include uh, are on ruby spheres and they uh, include a uniaxial deformation, a hydrostatic type deformation. It's, it was an attempt to be triaxial, but you can see particles are, are bulging, but the, the stress state in the sample is pretty hydrostatic still. In sample A here, we're basically loading, unloading, and reloading, and there's very little kinematics. The insets track individual particles in single colors. Here we see a lot of lateral kinematics. And in sample C, it was much closer to a real triaxial test um, in that we kept a very small lateral stress on the sample. Well, we basically have membranes around samples B and C and a fluid bath on the outside of those membranes. So all of these tests involve uh, the CT and diffraction measurements at each of the symbols you see here. So at every stress level, we're able to, to measure the structure and the stress state, except sample C. Like I said, we had problems with the, the stresses there um, for a number of reasons. One, that the stresses were a little bit too low. So this is the macroscopic just accumulated strain in the sample. So you see sample A gets to about 3%, sample B gets to 16%, and C gets to uh, whatever, 8%. And the kinematics are very different, of course. So let's first look at quantifying energy dissipation from rearrangements. And the formulation for doing this is, again, a unique demonstration of putting together the forces, which we've already talked about, and the kinematics from uh, CT and diffraction. So kinematics themselves, we can think about what happens to two particles across a small incremental uh, strain of our small macroscopic incremental strain. And we can determine with very high precision the contact deformation on some plane between the particles, basically this, the sliding on the contact plane, the relative rotation of particles is really finely obtained from 3D X-ray diffraction. If you remember, the resolution was very high on the uh, orientation of the particles. And when you combine the, the slip with 
rotation, which you can resolve into twisting and rolling, you can obtain energy dissipation. When you combine that with the forces from the previous slide, we can obtain energy dissipation due to slip and energy dissipation due to twist. And we can also, if we see a particle fracture, look at that crystal, crystallographic plane and its fracture energy and basically determine how much energy was dissipated in the generation of that new surface. So we'll take the kinematics. Here I'm showing slip in two of those samples, the uniaxial sample and the hydrostatic sample. This is the contact patches or contact points colored by the magnitude of the slip. This is in microns here and the particles are about 150 microns diameter. Our resolution is in the tens of nanometers for this slip. And these are the forces on one side of that, uh, on one side of the, the slip event. So putting this together in the framework on the previous slide, we're able to determine the, the total energy dissipated, which are the black curves here. The amount of that dissipation from slip, which are the gold or yellow curves, and that constitutes about 95% of the energy dissipated. The energy dissipated due to twist, which is orthogonal to slip, it's a, it's a different mode of energy dissipation, and that's very small, less than 5%. And the energy dissipation due to fracture, which in this case, uh, we have maybe 30 particles fracturing in each of these samples, and the energy dissipated is very small, 1% uh, or less, actually. So we can quantify where the energy dissipation is coming from. It's mostly these, these slip events, so these particles moving uh, past one another or simply undergo, you know, moving relative to their neighbors. They don't have to move past one another. And most of this is actually happening when a part for particles that are part of that strong force network, which for those who know about strong and weak force networks, um, it, it's happening mostly on forces greater than the mean, which is actually a minority of the total contacts in the packing. So this is the energy dissipation side of the picture. Um, what about rearrangement? So the fact that uh, energy is dissipated predominantly at these regions where we have some relative motion between particles. We want to define the rearrangements we're interested in examining as follows. We want to look for and study regions of the material in which we see non-affined displacement, rotation, and then local compaction, dilation, or shear. And these contribute differently to the total macroscopic deformation, but are important for a number of reasons. Um, these ones, you know, you can directly coarse grain local compaction dilation and shear in terms of strain into a macroscopic strain. Okay, so the way that we're going to address this is first we need to define the strain uh, that we're using to, to define all of these rearrangement measures. We define strain in the same way we did it in an earlier example. So we attach nodes to the centroids of particles and we follow those nodes as they deform and we can come up with a displacement gradient. It's a classical way of constructing a continuum equivalent strain tensor from Baggy. So we come up with a displacement gradient, a Cauchy stress, a Cauchy strain tensor uh, or a strain tensor, an infinitesimal rotation tensor. Uh, we can average these to get a grain average strain. And we can also average these in little coarse graining volumes to get and what we call an RVE strain. And we'll mostly be looking at RVEs that are 3R in, in radius. So they encapsulate basically a grain and its nearest neighbors and how those are deforming. With this strain, we can define the rearrangements we wanna look for. So we wanna look for local regions that are undergoing shear, dilation or contraction, some relative motion, which we quantify using this classical formula called D2 min, it quantifies non-affine relative translation of a particle and a, a comparable metric that quantifies the relative rotation of a particle. So you can kind of see these illustrated in these small, uh, uh, small pictures here. So these are the things that we want to understand a little bit more uh, in all three of those samples that I showed you. The way that we are going to examine why these rearrangements are occurring is by using 
some set of variables to try to predict them and to see how good those predictions are. So we're going to use the history of the rearrangements, so what they did in a previous load step, the, just the local structure, so a snapshot of the structure right before rearrangements occur, and the stresses and forces, so just the, the basically what the stress or the forces on a particle are. So these are all of those variables we can use. There's actually quite a lot of ways of, come, of characterizing the local structure, simple ones like porosity, more difficult uh, things to conceptualize like bond orientation, which tell you something about the crystallinity. And then metrics that measure basically how important a particle is for connecting different parts of the material. So these are network-based metrics that treat particles as nodes on these complex graphs or complex net networks. We also have stresses from 3D X-ray diffraction and the history of what the particle did in the last time we incrementally loaded it. Um, I could go into a little more detail here, but basically some of these variables are slightly correlated. So the proper way of using these to predict all of those rearrangements is to uncorrelate them so that we don't bias our predictions with correlations. So we actually perform a principal component analysis to turn, let's say, these 28 variables into 28 orthogonal basis vectors for this uh, input prediction. OK, but basically, you can think that we're just trying to wait. We're just trying to, to use all of these input variables to predict whether a rearrangement will happen. So the way we do this is using right now just uh, simple machine learning algorithms. So they're basically ways of linearly dividing all of the uh, dividing the response space using all of these variables. So in, these are our three samples once again. And if we want to predict the top, let's say we have a, a single load step in which we have all of these rearrangements. If we want to pick the the most uh, intense fifteen percent of those shear rearrangements. Um, instead of, so we want to predict the 15% um, highest magnitude shear events. What we are essentially saying is we want to be able to lay down a, a plane, a hyperplane, if you will, that is in the space of all of these variables that divides the large events from the small events. And then if we go to another load step, we can uh, take the properties of that structure and stress for that particle and determine whether it will fall in the large, the top 15%, or the small events, the bottom 85%. And these large events are the ones that are really the, the ones that we seek because those are the, the ones that really disturb the packing significantly and accommodate most of the macroscopic strain. So we've, we've used these linear machine learning techniques, linear discriminant analysis support vector machine, which I'm graphically showing. And what I'm going to show is if we use these techniques, the accuracy of these techniques uh, is going to be quantified by the predicted number of these 15% of these events that are actually large events. Okay, so let's look at how well we do when we use different input variables. So if we use only the structure to create this hyperplane and predict where all of these, where rearrangements will occur, we do remarkably well. Uh, we, we obtain predictions of local rotation, of local compactive strain for a given particle with accuracies between 60 and 80%. If we add stresses, we don't really do any better. And so this is our first sort of remarkable finding that adding stresses does not seem to improve the accuracy of our predictions. And as an illustration of our predictions, this is a location in a single load step of this experiment. The, the colored particles are the locations of those top 15% of the, the shear events. And this is the, the truth. So this is where they actually are. So we are doing a prediction just based on a snapshot of the structure right before the rearrangements occur. And then we compare it with the ground truth. And this is what we see. So we do really well with just structure. That's, that's quite remarkable. And it leads us to ask what what aspect of the structure helps us make these predictions? And it turns out, I'm just showing the most highly correlated variable, but the structure parameters that really help us make predictions of rearrangements in granular media uh, 
are things like local porosity, but also things like betweenness centrality. So some of those network measures play a really important role. So how important a particle is on a complex network connecting different parts of the sample. We can actually use these structure variables to predict the magnitude of a rearrangement as well. So I can now give you just some structure variables and you can tell me where a rearrangement will occur and the magnitude of that rearrangement. So how much of the total strain is gonna be accommodated by that, uh, that rearrange, a rearrangement event at that particle base just on its structure. Um, so this is the multivariate regression. And now I'm showing the colors here of these particles in our predicted uh, rearrangements are uh, basically how severe the rearrangement is. So what the magnitude is, uh, local strain, um, D2 min, local rotation, and the, the correlations are pretty strong. So I'm going to speed up a little. I see I'm running uh, pretty low on time here. So uh, a couple more things with rearrangements. Um, these findings seem to transcend sort of the specifics of individual samples. So we're able to train on sample A and test on sample B, which I'm showing here, with also really good accuracy. Um, again, 60 to 80% accuracy in predicting rearrangements. And we can do the same for uh, mixing up the other samples, which suggests that it's really the structure and it's not that we're overtrained on a particular sample. It's, it's really this, the, these, these structural features that are furnishing rearrangements are really quite universal, it seems. Um, as, a, as a mechanician, we can also ask, how are these local rearrangements related to one another? So when we have some local shear strain, how is it related to the local volume strain? And we find some correlations. For instance, when we have shearing, we tend to have compaction. So this process also leads to a compaction process actually moving this way. And non-affine translation is related to non-affine rotation. Um, so there, there's actually implications for each of these for uh, micromechanics models that are actually in use. So quick summary of, of this, I'll just throw up what I've talked about so far. Rearrangements um, are sufficient to predict, uh, or sorry, local structure is sufficient to predict rearrangements. Kind of surprising that stresses are not significant um, and don't significantly help us. We can train in one geometry and test in another. This indicates that our findings are somewhat universal and our rearrangements are, are interrelated in somehow with implications for micromechanics. So I see, let's see, I have uh, just a couple minutes left. So I'll, I'll just highlight the, uh, for, for one minute, um, what we've applied some of this extraction of structure and forces to in terms of wave propagation. So that there's these interesting properties I've noted, uh, wave scaling with pressure, frequency and pressure, attenu uh, frequency and pressure dependent attenuation. And to probe this experimentally, these are basically our questions, dispersion, attenuation, velocity scaling. We perform specific, special experiments where we take a granular packing and we send ultrasound waves through it. And we monitor the stress and the, the packing and we uh, exert different forces on the material, different stress levels on the material. And we send different types of, of, uh, of pulses through the material and try to tease out um, what's affecting the velocity, what's affecting the dispersion, and what's affecting the attenuation of this little packing. So this is our sort of experimental framework. Um, our findings, basically, to, to summarize quickly, is we can, we can match the experimental observations of wave velocity scaling only by making predictions on a network that involves the heterogeneous forces. And I can go into more detail um, if you're interested, but basically this supports the idea that the, the waves that travel through these packings, the first arrival wave is really traveling on a strong force chain in this packing. And that's what's controlling the scaling of the first arrival uh, with the macroscopic stress. So the velocity scaling, this question number one is governed by packing and force heterogeneity. The attenuation we can also measure as a function of frequency. We can also look at uh, uniform spring networks and, heter and heterogeneous spring networks that we generate directly from our experiments. And we can show that uh, basically the attenuation is governed primarily by packing structure. Okay, so that's, 
Uh, sorry, I went through that one fast, but I want to uh, close on time. So I've shown you a number of applications of this experimental framework. Hopefully I've convinced you that it provides really unique access into these things going on at the, the micro scale and these really important micro mechanics questions and how we connect things across length scales. We're also working at, at moving things up to larger length scales by looking at uh, shear band nucleation uh, and down to smaller length scales by making tribological measurements. So with that, I'll just put up the thank you slide, uh, thanking sponsors, showing my group. I'll take any questions if there's time for them. Thank you so much, Ryan. This was really great. I'm sure you would hear a, a great applause if we were in a, in a usual context, but this was really, really nice and impressive. So I'm sure there are questions. I wanna open the floor for a few questions. In the interest of time, maybe a couple, since it's, uh, yeah, sorry there are a few meetings later. Don't, 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 don't worry, don't worry. We, we'll have a few questions. So I know Gianluca has one. He reserved the spot, and I see it's then a crazy thing. So second spot is also assigned. So Gianluca, why, why don't you go ahead? Thank, thank you, Serge. Thank you, Ryan. Great presentation. My question is going to be very short, so probably we can have time for another question. You presented a few slides where you had um, formulas to compute uh, continuum strain tensors and stress tensor from the discrete versions, from discrete yes. forces and, and displacements. Um, are those macro, uh, not macroscopic, uh, they're local, right? They're at the level of grains, I suppose, or yes. grains, or something like that. Are those local measurements uh, and then, of course, then you, you have homogenized the version at the level of the RVE, right? Yes. So are those both the local and the, and the homogenized um, uh, energy conjugate? In other words, if you compute the energy using those stress tensors and the corresponding strain tensor, do you get the correct energy that you have in actually in your discrete system? Uh, that's a good question. It's not one that I've tested. Uh, I haven't tested it at that level of energy. What I can say is that the strain measurement um, is, so the strain measurement itself is only sort of an approximation. It will deviate, especially at larger strains from the, macro, the macroscopic strain. So um, in some sense, the strain is even an approximation here, um, but it's within a couple percent of the macroscopic strain. In terms of energy, we haven't tried that, but it's something that uh, because you know try. it would be interesting to see because once you have a definition of the strain, well, you could define you can define you could define through the principle of which are power or principle of which are work the the energy conjugate of that strain. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how they are, that compare with the stress, the virial stress formula that you instead use for uh, in, in right, other, right. other places. Yeah, that's a great, great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ryan. You. Thank you. Danek, you have a question, right? A great lecture, uh, very interesting. I would like to make two points. One is you listed about 50 parameters you consider for change, but one parameter which has been considered not a role of voids, their movements or low density regions. That was, I think, brought forward by Ken Cumbry when he was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And they also affect the response and him modeled, I think, uh, uh, shear bands. Yes. Uh, and the other point is that, but I don't have an answer, that this crossing of the force chains actually could indicate deviations from Weibull statistic chain model, which uh, uh, is based on the other way, chain, which means uh, crossing of the force chains could indicate some deviations. But uh, that's not, uh, I think, uh, feasible right now. That's all. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, I think uh, local porosity or local voids um, uh, do play a role. They're not entirely captured in these structure measures, um, like you noted. Um, and I'll look into the second point that you mentioned. Uh, it's not, not something that I've thought about, I think. <laughs>
And so very last question, Jibril, please go ahead. See you raise your hand. Yeah, uh, hi, thank you very much for a great uh, lecture again. I had a question regarding the uh, independent on stress. Do you think it might be due to the fact that particles are spherical? Or would you also expect a structure only dependence for more complex shapes? Um, good question. I'm not sure about dependence on particle shape. I think one of the reasons, I, I can tell you what I do think one of the reasons comes from, I think this independence on stress actually comes partially from the length scale on which we're looking at this. One would expect as we go to a macro scale, things are going to obey a macroscopic stress uh, response. So the, lo the, the failure at that scale is going to follow a plasticity law or more Coulomb or something. So there the stress will be important, but at the micro scale, there's caging effects. And there's, I, I think that the structure sort of plays an increasingly important role as we take the RV size down, which we haven't probed here. I haven't looked at particle shape. I haven't thought too much about it. I would suspect it would be similar. The, the scaling might change a little bit as a function of the RV scale, but uh, I expect your results would be somewhat similar in that case. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much once again. Uh, uh, I suspect there may be more, but in the interest of time, I think it's, uh, uh, it's time to wrap it up. And anyway, there are a few meetings with Ryan, so I'm sure there will be more discussion uh, at least at an individual level later. Uh, but once again, thank you, Ryan. Great talk. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks again thank for you everybody invite. who attended.